Good morning, everyone. My name is John Hirding, uh, I, and thank you for joining today's event titled Lantern Pharma, uh, NASDAQ LTRN, uh, How Artificial Intelligence is Crushing Drug Discovery Times and Costs in Cancer. Pretty exciting topic these days uh, when you when uh, I don't think you could go a second and not hear about AI or artificial intelligence and the many ways that there are uh, being applied to our lives as it will be for the uh, forever more as I can see. Um, please note again that I am the managing member of Tribe Public. Um, our website is www.tribepublic.com. I'm also uh, the Managing Director of Vista Partners, a registered investment advisor uh, in California. And uh, its website is www.vistapglobal.com. Uh, please review uh, both sets of disclaimers at each site and note that I'm an advisor and shareholder of Lana Pharma. Uh, again, appreciate all of you for, for joining today. And also note that after this, um, as soon as we can, we will take uh, this video of this presentation and publish it at uh, tri our Tribe Public YouTube channel, um, and then include it in our Tribe This Week, a weekly e-newsletter that goes out um, every Friday after the market closes. Uh, again, thanks for coming in here. Um, as many of you know, we've, we've hosted events across the country in the U.S. pre-COVID, uh, and have ramped that back up as of January when we started at JP Morgan uh, with leaders of companies that the tribe cares about, like today. Um, and through that process, uh, we also started doing these types of webinars to reach an audience beyond the US and now have over 25 plus countries coming into our events uh, to enjoy, to meet, and to ask the questions that they have for these leaders of companies that uh, the tribe have submitted. And the way you submit it is a, a simple process. It's the, called the wish list process at Tribe Public. You simply put in a ticker of a NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange company or a name, or make a formal introduction to the CEO that you would like others to hear about and or you would like to have more direct access to. Um, our events are efficient on these webinars. They're only about 30 minutes. Um, we try to do uh, a, a very nice presentation and a Q&A session. And remember that you can submit your questions, if you already haven't, um, ahead of time through the Zoom chat feature uh, that's available to you today. Um, today today's event is, again, co-hosted by Panna Sharma. Uh, Panna is the Chief Executive Officer of Lan Lantern Pharma. Uh, again, it's a uh, trading symbol of the NASDAQ is LTRN. Um, and Lantern is an artificial intelligence company developing targeted and transformative cancer therapies using its proprietary AI and machi machine learning platform, Radar, with, and has multiple clinical stage drug programs. Pretty exciting times to catch, uh, uh, an opportunistic time to catch uh, uh, Pana. And Pana, I wanted to thank you again for agreeing to uh, participate and to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself today and about Lantern. Um, would you please start today by, uh, again, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, and then we'll I'll, I'll request that you pull up your presentation. We'll go right at it. Again, remember all, if you have questions as we go along, just submit them to the Zoom chat feature. We'll do our best to get them uh, accommodated today. Thanks again. Hi, Panna. Hey, John. Thank you for having me on. I always appreciate it. Uh, it's always great to talk to you about our company. Um, a little bit about my background, I joined Lantern Pharma to help them really accelerate and achieve their mission of developing cancer medicines more cost effectively and with greater precision. But really it wasn't until about three and four years ago that we actually had the computing power, the cost, and some of the algorithms to really achieve these things. And you know, there's no nothing more clear than just a number of both public and private companies now that are using different forms of AI to try to accelerate and unlock the potential of creating new medicines. So we're focused entirely on cancer. You know, by way of background, I was CEO of another biotech company that was focused on uh, cancer diagnostics and cancer services. Uh, we did tons of work for large pharmas and cancer hospitals around the world, and I saw the power of the data generated from our biomarker studies and sequencing. And so it's always in the back of my mind, how can we 
harness all this data better to make better decisions. Same time, biological data was getting, the quality was just getting higher. The number of people publishing was in, growing vastly. And finally, the computing power was getting to the point where you can actually do things and not wait around, you know, 200 days for things to actually churn through the cloud. And so here we are now in the cusp of 2024, then to 2023, and Lantern has gone from one drug program when I joined in late 2018 to today, 14 programs, 12 of them uh, that we wholly own, two of them that were partnered with other biopharma companies where our platform is being used to help accelerate and power their decision process. So we own small pieces of those of those um, companies or of the of the drug. But the vast opportunity that's really happened for us, and you know, obviously we're publicly traded, ticker LTRN, so you know, please take a look at our disclosures as well. Um, is that we've been able to explode the number of programs that we have or number of shots on goal um, so quickly and so rapidly. And that's what I'll talk about today. And I think we're just at the cusp of how this is going to happen. I think in the next couple of years, you'll actually see programs, uh, maybe from Lantern, perhaps from others, that were really developed entirely through the use of data and AI that actually get across the finish line to patients. And so we're dosing patients now. So we're one of a handful of companies that actually is using AI that actually has cancer therapies uh, in the clinic. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about how we've done that, how quickly and at what cost today. Fantastic. Uh, by way of background, I actually did study AI in college, you know, a long time ago when it was still much more theoretical than practical. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I was always really, really fascinated by kind of how the brain worked. And when I realized I couldn't really stomach doing <laughs> anything really invasive in the brain, <laughs> I decided to focus more on you know, some of the theoretical stuff. And actually my initial studies were really on neural networks and AI theory at the time, kind of looking at how neural networks were different from traditional AI and if that really constituted a paradigm change or not. So I, after I studied that, you know, I went to a uh, career in kind of banking, consulting, and then uh, really since uh, 2013, and focused really on just being a CEO of uh, public public companies, and that's probably one of my shareholders asking why they can't get into this webinar. <laughs> there you go. Well, hopefully, hopefully they'll find a way, and if they can, yeah. uh, they can email. Let me, let me share my share my screen just so we have that up as a backdrop. Let's see how we do that. Go. And again, for for today, I'll make sure that we spend um, time going through some of our our work, but really also very importantly, spend time on making sure we have time for questions from your community as well, because I'm sure that's one of the reasons they are here, you know, to ask questions. So with that I'm going to go ahead and get started. Is that all right? That's great, please. Yeah. So as I said, you know, we may. We will probably make forward looking statements. So I urge you guys to take a look at our website and also our full disclosure. We also have our 10K and most recent Qs filed both on our website as well at Lantern Pharma, the IR site. And uh, we may or may not update any of these forward looking statements. So let's talk a little bit about why um, AI and why, why radar. I mean, so we today, like I said, we have 14 drug programs that we've traded since I joined the company. Uh, most of those since we went public and raised $96 million. And we have about $48 million on our balance sheet today. We've got 90 plus patents and we have five clinical programs. It's cost us about a million and a half to $2 million for our programs to get to phase one trials, which is an unheard of number and an average time of less than three years, two to three years. And some of them are as short as one year. So we think that really is just the cusp. And then we're just now at the beginning of being able to do this. We have a number of other programs that we haven't even talked about that have, you know, costs of under a million dollars and under a year and a half, and they're um, also in development. So the way the radar works, as I get into that, is, you know, we're trying to solve the essential problem is, you know, the drug discovery approaches have less than 10% success rate, but there's so much data out there and more and more of it's being published. And we can use this data to create better correlations about different kinds of questions we have about the molecules. We can have questions answered about biomarkers, which biomarkers are really needed. And today, it you know, always surprises me when you still have oncology studies with great, brilliant teams and CEOs where they haven't done adequate biomarker profiling in late stage trials. 
and then can't go back and understand why things work or don't work. And using biomarkers properly can increase the, odd, uh, the odds of a clinical trial success significantly. And that also is not only so you can type the right kind of cancer, but also so you can stratify patients. And so this allows you to reduce the cost of development because you're asking much more targeted questions. And that's really the core of our engine. Our business model, just so you understand why we do what we do, is either we are going to take a drug that has failed historically, like our LP300 program, and figure out why it works really well in a certain population, understand the biological dynamics of that population, model that in silico, repeat that in the wet lab, take it back to the FDA and launch. We're now in a phase two trial because we better understand how that molecule will work or not work. Second is to actually develop entirely new molecules. So as our platform grew, we went from not just being able to understand how a molecule works, but then look at the core mechanism or the core pharmacophore of a molecule and figure out how can we replicate that and create entirely new molecules. And so a great example of that is LP284. Um, and then we developed that and now we're in a phase one trial that's about to launch, hopefully uh, later this year in Q4. And that's in a timeline of about two and a half years. So we went to the whiteboard in Q4 of 2020. Uh, in Q1, we kind of had some ideas about the molecules. We published in uh, ASH later that year, and then we published ASH again and SOHO. And now we have a molecule that was never never thought about before. Now it's about to go into humans in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and cost of probably under two and a half million dollars for all that preclinical work, including manufacturing of the product. And then third is to accelerate and de-risk programs for our partners. As you mentioned, we have two of those now. We're looking at more partners. We get a small piece of the upside. But if we can help others with our platform and help them narrow in and increase their odds of success, say from sub 10% to 20 or 30 or 50%, and even narrow the patient population in a much more targeted trial, we get some of that upside. And so we've done that now with Actuate. We were able to predict in actual uh, patients an 88% accuracy rate for a very unique drug, uh, their GSK3 beta inhibitor. So this is the power of data. So we, can, we have multiple paths to succeed and generate upside for our shareholders. But the biggest one, obviously, is breakthrough medicines. You know, how do we create new medicines and then partner or license those out, which we expect to do over the next year or two. So the way we've created radar Today, you know, it's about 34 billion data points. We started the year around 25. We'll probably end the year uh, well over 50. We have thousands and thousands of data sets. But one interesting thing that is really unique is the algorithms, because you can all, always have highly curated and clean data, and that's wonderful to have. But then what are the algorithms? When I joined, we had a couple of algorithms, three or four. They mostly were run locally. They weren't even cloud native. Now everything's cloud native highly secure, containerized, and we have over 200 advanced algorithms. And now these algorithms can turn themselves on, they can compete with one another, and they have their own pros and cons. Different algorithms solve different kinds of problems by extracting features, playing features against one another. And some of the things that we do, and we do repeatedly, and we do over and over, we create modules out of them. So a module could be on defining a mechanism of action for a compound or drug. A module is also identifying a compound's best indications. Maybe it works best in a subtype of melanoma, but doesn't really work in a certain type of mutant lung cancer. But say it works really well in a certain subtype of stomach cancer, but doesn't really work in other colorectal cancers. But prioritizing and identifying those subtypes, because every single cancer is so unique and different, you want the one where you have the best chance of success in the trial. And that's just both a statistical problem as well as a data problem. And so we model those to best understand how can our shot on goal really get as close as possible to that finish line. Third, what is the right drug combinations? In fact, there was a recent trial that just failed because of drug combinations. So the drug, combi the drug worked, but it didn't work as well as it could have. And the company chose to pick only one drug to combine it with when really when we looked at it, we, we really seemed like a two drug combination in a very certain type of uh, platinum resistant cancer. And again, um, optimizing these combinations early on in the development cycle can help you actually get across the finish line or it can save you millions of dollars in failed trials or a failed arm of a trial. Finally, how do you develop a biomarker signature? That's our module four. Module five is the blood brain barrier penetrability of a molecule, which we're now globally ranked, I think the top 
four or five of the top six algorithms in the world now are all lanterns. Um, that's on therapeutic data commons. Um, also optimal combinations with developing an ADC. Actually, we're one of the first companies that actually has a complete module to enhance the selection of how do you create an ADC, which can be very, very complicated because you have an antibody, a linker, and a drug. So it's a really complex combinatorial problem. And so now we've developed a module because we did it first manually. And now we're saying, you know, how can we get the machine to do it? And instead of having just a, a table full of smart people churning through this, imagine now having tens of thousands of smart people that don't need to go to sleep, that don't need to eat, that don't have their own biases that really bring to the table that are churning through all this data. And that's the power of AI. It's like you can never have enough smart minds attacking a problem and attacking a problem without bias. And that's what we get with AI. And then finally, uh, a really important problem around checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, we're seeing that as a big problem in the pharma community. We've heard from pharma customers and collaborators that both checkpoint inhibitors and ADC development are two big problems. And so we're developing the future of radar to solve those two big, which I think are multi-million dollar problems. And again, we're solving them not because we want to be a service company. We're solving them because we have to solve them for our own drugs anyway. So our thought is, you know, first and foremost, if we're going to get a drug across the finish line, in, we have to create, we have to solve those problems. You know, what do we combine with 184 in an IO setting? So we looked at that and we said, okay, now we can try to characterize this for a broader set of drugs and a broader set of drugs and a broader range of cancers. And so that's how we start. We always try to sol start by solving a very specific problem and then by opening it up and growing the problem set larger and larger and more complex. And so we've done that. We have seven modules. It'll continue growing. We're uh, consistently ranked as one of the top end-to-end -end AI drug discovery companies. As you'll notice, a lot of the other companies there are kind of multi-billion dollar companies, but for a small company, uh, we, you know, we're kind of always in that kind of upper right-hand corner. This is according to Deep Pharma Intelligence as of last year. I think uh, Biopharma Trend also came out with an article just like a month or two ago where we were one of the top 10 uh, AI companies uh, with drugs and trials. So it consistently ranks and we consistently continue to build the platform as well. So talking more about the platform, you know, we get data from lots of different places. People always ask that we have our own proprietary data, but we also supplement that with other data sources from public trials, our own in vitro or in vivo studies, genetic screening and hotspot panels, information about the chemical structure of the classes that we're looking at, information from collaborators that we're working with, collaborators like Fox Chase and Johns Hopkins and the National Cancer Institute. Uh, we have our own multiomic screens that we're running pretty routinely, and also other cancers, um, sorry, other cancer researchers, and then looking at public and private repositories. All these hundreds or thousands of data sets that we ingest every quarter need to be curated, tagged, cleaned, understood, and then given some kind of quality score and so we do that. More and more of it's now automated. So that's why we're able, you know, again, it took us four years since I got here for us to get to 25 billion, which is a lot of data. But we're now going to go from 25 billion to 50 billion in less than a year. Wow. Right? So that's, that's the speed at which we're, and, you know, we think the next will be 100. You know, it'll, it'll just continue growing. When we went public uh, a little over three years ago, we were at about 250 million data points. So, you know, you already see, you know, 100x increase just in that time, and we're going to double that from 25 to 50 easily this year. So all that data with the data team that ingests the data, and then we have algorithm teams of computational biologists that are saying, okay, now how do I look at this data to make a drug combination, to create a biomarker signature, to look at certain molecular attributes that are really unique that I want to fine tune, and those algorithms help answer those problems day and night. And we have hundreds of algorithms across lots of different uh, uh, families, including some that we have patents on. So we patented uh, the use of ensemble algorithms to automatically um, self, um, you know, basically create ensembles by themselves by picking high performing algorithms and put them together to solve those problems. We filed a couple of patents around that. So we don't just, you know, we have a goal in terms of a roadmap to not only scale the number of data points, but also to increase the scope of the platform to solve lots of problems with various classes of drugs, and then also functional modules that allow us to answer more advanced questions in drug development. 
And so that we think that's going to be a very important item of our future is that we'll constantly have a platform generating new ideas for us and our partners. One of our partners is Actuate, where we've helped them not only predict patient response with greater accuracy, but also find new indications. And this was published at ASCO and at AACR this year. Um, and these insights are informing the design of the next phase of their trial. And so again, we had 88% accuracy from real world data, from actual patient data on telling who would respond or not respond from um, our a very, you know, iterative neural network trained model. And so and it's, you know, it's not a black box, you know, we know exactly why certain items are higher in feature importance than others. Uh, they make biological sense and statistical sense. And so uh, we'll be able to share why certain patients are prioritized over others based on uh, the neural network. So again, that data doesn't just come from us. It comes from all the work we do with collaborators. We presented work from University of uh, Bellefeld recently with our ADC module. Uh, we did our, our pancreatic cancer work at Fox Chase, our GBM work at Johns Hopkins and UT Health. And um, all these institutions help drive the data, but also insights. And you know, we validate our insights. So if our AI says, hey, we really think this is going to work well in this subtype of pancreatic cancer, well, that's great. We can now go to two or three or four institutions and validate that in animals or in human-derived organoids or other biological systems and then feed all that data back into our radar. So it becomes recursive. So it's not just one way out. It's also data that goes back in to improve the algorithms and make it more biologically robust. So this is yielded in a pretty, uh, I think, a very um, robust platform of opportunities. Any one of these drugs gets across the finish line could be worth billions. I think they can be worth hundreds of millions in phase two as they get licensed or partnered out. Um, and many of those that we generated, uh, we get, were very excited by because they were in a super challenging category of cancer called brain and CNS cancers. And I got to the company in 2018 and 2019, we had no brain cancer programs. And in 2020, late 2019, we found a signal with one of our drugs that suggested CNS cancers. And a few months later, we were like, wow, it is, that signal is correct. Uh, six, nine months later, we said the signal can actually go across other types of brain cancer. We had five or six that we prioritized. We then took them to the lab, we took them to collaborators, they were all spot on, including in an ultra rare pediatric brain cancer. And so we saw the power of the platform and we took a big step back. We said, wow, this is, we're now going after five or six of the very in, entrenched brain cancers, many of these that have no therapy options. And we said, we have to go after this. We created a wholly owned subsidiary called Starlight. You'll hear, hear a lot more about that. But Starlight has multiple orphan indications. It has a rare pediatric voucher that we can get for ATRT, and we're gonna go directly into phase two next year after the phase one is done by Lantern. So Starlight will be an entirely new company born from AI. So if it weren't for the AI, it could have taken four or five years to do all this. We did it in under two years, probably a year and a half. And we have five, six indications going directly to phase two. A lot of pharma companies have expressed interest in learning more about Starlight Therapeutics. And this will be a big event for us, I think, in next year. And that alone could be worth, you know, eight to 10 times our market cap. At Lantern, we'll continue our pipeline. We have a drug in phase two, that's a 90 patient trial. We have a drug in phase one that just started for advanced solid tumors that are DNA damage repair deficient. Uh, we're enrolling patients in that, that'll be a 30 to 35 patient phase one. And we have one that we expect to launch by the end of the year uh, in non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, uh, especially recurrent ones where um, bortezomib and abrutinib or other drugs fail. And so again, big need in that area. So we've got multiple shots on goal. Um, and I can talk about you know, any of the programs in detail and how, you know, how we use radar to, to rescue this drug, for example, um, and also in 184, how we used radar to really uh, understand the mechanism of action and validate it using CRISPR in the lab and then find new indications rapidly and have most indications that we went after, almost we had a close to 100% success rate in terms of the indication that the computer suggested, taking that into lab and then validating it. So these are indications that would have taken 
easily each indication would have taken a year or even longer. And so this shows that we can not only generate insights in silica, but validate them quickly. And then very importantly, a key next step is how do you operationalize it clinically, which our team has also been able to do. And we've been able to do this at, um, a, you know, at, a, at a rate where we're spending between, you know, uh, I would say between four and $5 million per quarter. So it's a, it's a burn rate that is very manageable uh, after indications where there's oftentimes no standard of care and we've generated enough IP to go after a whole new category called uh, brain and CNS cancers, where there really hasn't been an approval. And we think we'll do this again with other drugs. So our ADC program, that could be a spin out in a year or two as well. So that's our goal at Lantern is like to take drugs, push them along, license them out, or generate new classes where we can put them together and then spin those out much like a Roy Vant model or a, a Bay Bridge model. And so, um, you know, the platform will only continue to grow. We'll only file more patents. And the great thing about this is as we do more collaborations, those collaborations will actually teach the platform even more because, you know, we have our own biases in terms of the types of molecules we like and the types of indications. But as we solve more and more problems for a broader range of partners, the platform will have that institutionalized knowledge. So it's a very exciting time to use data and AI to solve some really complex problems. Doesn't mean it'll always be right, but it does tell you that we can generate insights that will be useful in shortening and compressing the timeline to get to maybe a right answer. And we can also, if it's not good, we can also dump it. So that's also a very important part of, of, of biotech is learning to you know, fail fast if you are gonna fail or dump a program fast and accelerate the next one. So all, the, all this is all possible because of data and very importantly, because of the computational power that the cloud brings to our doorstep. So I'll take a quick pause there, and then, you know, since we have a couple minutes, try to answer questions that people might have. Absolutely. Actually, the uh, one of the questions is in regards to your financial highlights. Maybe just take us through that slide since you have it up. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, as of the 6.30 or, you know, the second quarter, we had $48 million in cash and uh, cash equivalents and marketable securities. So when I say marketable securities, we're really talking about, you know, <clears throat> uh, U.S. Treasury and, you know, not, not, we're not holding like you know, small cap and mano cap companies were, you know, this is mostly uh, stuff that we're getting four or 5% return on some of these, uh, on these treasuries and, and uh, U.S. bonds. And uh, we've got about 10.8 million shares, common shares outstanding, fully, di fully diluted, a little under 12, about 12. And uh, we're trading at about our market cap, you know, so market cap's 48 million, our cash is 48 million. So it's a great time. That means we're getting no value for our platform and no value for any of our drug programs. And we're actively dosing patients now. So it's not like we're gonna be doing trials a year from now or two years from now. It's like we're, we're in trials today. So, so uh, in relation to this, could you also speak um, of the 10.87 million, how much is in institution hand, institutions hands? Um, I don't know, there's been some churn obviously in the markets, but I would say somewhere close between 25 and 25, 28%, probably right under 30%. And, and is, the, are, is there any, you know, 10% plus holder of the outstanding stock uh, in that group or? Uh, there's two that are pretty close, BIOS, you know, which has been a long-term historical partner and actually funded the company privately, continues to own a big share. You know, I don't know their latest, but they're, you know, well above 10%. And then we had another one that's right at 9% as well. Okay. So it's it's actually fairly high for yeah, a... actually, sorry I, I there's actually three so uh, BIOS Biomedic and a third uh, yeah so there's three that right are at a ten percent or above and then the third one's right at right under ten percent nine something okay. and so it's pretty high institutional ownership for a relatively small um, market cap or a company in, in my estimation so which is very interesting to me. Um, the uh, what I guess sort of a follow up question: Do you um, uh, currently enjoy? Uh, do you have any analysts that are covering you in the mark uh, from the sell side? Uh, I think the most recent analyst just left. The, there were the analysts at EF Hunt that did a very good job. I think they just left. Mm -hmm. uh, think Equity covers us. We have paid for research from Zach's that covers us. Uh, but I think we're going to bring be bringing on another analyst or two pretty quickly. 
Gotcha. I would think um, and one of the questions regards to NVIDIA's investment in rec uh, recursion pharma uh, recently that uh, opened a lot of eyes and you're seeing investment across the board for the Magnificent Seven in different areas, including healthcare. Um, any thoughts around, you know, that process and the investment you're seeing coming across and, you know, uh, it, not that you could speak to if anybody's looking at you, but uh, uh, from that standpoint, but could you just give us your reaction to, you know, why that's happening and what are you seeing out there? Sure. Um, first of all, I think it's great because it brings a lot of eyeballs and attention to, you know, why these AI companies or a chip company in this case would look at the pharma. And I'll dig down into the details. So no deal is really complete unless you know the details of the deal. Um, I think it'll open up other large tech companies to partner with AI focused drug discovery companies. Uh, you know, we have a number of discussions going on, but if you look at the $50 million, you know, recursions burn rate in a quarter is 63 to 66 million. So just to put that in perspective, it's less than one quarter of burn. Second is in uh, recursion does a great job in digitizing biology, which is really they're I mean, they're going after like kind of shoot the moon type stuff, which is great. And they have a high burn also, you know, to try to do that. But a lot of what they do is on site computing of large scale images that never make their way up to the cloud always. So imagine taking tens of thousands of high def images of 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 chemistry reactions or biochemical reactions. And so from those images, they can see which compounds are showing activity and then advance those compounds. So all those images that they're, ta that they're taking, like for, usually from under flat bottom glass well plates or whatever other substrate, all that then gets to be fed into the NVIDIA machine. So as they migrated from the last round of uh, chips, you know, chips have skyrocketed in power, right? skyrocket in the last three years and NVIDIA being at the forefront, but there are a lot of other good chips too, but NVIDIA definitely at the forefront. They need to replace all their old stuff with new stuff. That cost, I guess, probably about 20 to $30 million. Wow, okay. So, you know, my guess is that investment is, you know, gets plowed right back into operationalizing their large scale image analysis infrastructure, which makes sense to me. Now ours is we're not doing images yet. We're really focused on the biomarker, biological data, chemical features, and um, chemoinformatic information that we're extracting of the molecule. So that really is purely, you know, that's you know really binary, you know, that's really ones and zeros. So we're able to have, I think, a much leaner um, computational infrastructure. We're not as computationally intensive. It's good and bad, you know, we're not looking at images because Partly we don't need to. Can we incorporate image analysis? Yes, that is one of the things on our roadmap. But I think we'll do that once we have a big tech partner. Um, but we're able to do a lot of this without uh, large scale image analysis. So that's even better. And so that is what we're doing. We do it all cloud. So we don't do any on site computing. Everything is in the cloud. So I can, you know, our goal, as our chief, one of our chief architects put it, puts it this way, is he wants to be able to take his computer at the end of the day and throw it out and be able to go to work tomorrow. And so that's always his goal It's like, you know, you should be able to take whatever machine you're working on, throw it out next day, turn it on and get back to work. And that, trust me, when he came in with that from the Broad Institute and, you know, had that kind of mindset, people really looked at him the wrong way. I loved it because I thought, you know what, that you're right. That is the future of how we should do highly secure containerized computing. We should have to rely on people remembering where it files and data and where the data is and what sequence in the algorithm development I was. And so now we can do that. So that's pretty, that's pretty amazing. So we do everything in the cloud, not, not very little to zero on site. And almost none of the large scale computing is done on site. All that's done in the cloud. Uh, so I think um, that has some advantages over time. Got it. Thank you. Um, re related to, you know, sort of the, the cash um, situ you know, your, your uh, cash equivalents and cash on hand, and and looking for the cash runway, it says here till twenty twenty five. In between that time, what do you in your, as as the title of this is you know crushing timelines and costs? What do you see in the relatively near near future of value generating milestones that really could excite people about what you're doing? 
Well, definitely the trials, as we get trial data, we'll be sharing that from the first couple of cohorts of patients. Uh, launching the 284 trial, I think first patient enrolled in 184, I think those will be exciting points. I think we'll have some publications that are coming out in pretty prestigious peer-reviewed journals. And then of course, the, the next steps in Starlight, which should be pretty exciting. I think launching that directly into a phase two can be a real moving event. But I think people are gonna wait for data to come out from the trials. And then I think any additional collaborations around our platform, either with pharma or with tech players. So I think over the next two years, we'll be able to hit most of all those data points. Okay. And in between now and let's just go year end, right? Um, it's not too far away now, but it, are, are there, are, do you believe there'll be further reveals that you'll be able to come out and validations in any, any of the programs or any in, in any way uh, that really uh, could excite people by the end of the year? Um, I think so. I think we'll have data from our LP184 trial that's getting going. I think we'll have the first cohort of patients um, for that. And I think we'll launch the LP284 trial before the end of the year also. So I think those two will have um, you know, some announcements. Okay. And Starlight, the, 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 the CNS-focused company that you're rolling out, that seems like there could be a, a significant amount of value created with that, and that could be further understood between now and say in the next six months. Um, you know, do, do you have a current management team that is in place? Are you working on that? Or I, I would, yeah, we're, yeah, we're yeah. working on that. So the phase one A will drive the phase two dosing, and so we're going to go into phase two across these indications I just pulled up. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we're really, you know, we're actively talking for some senior hires for Starlight. Uh, we've started some discussions with uh, private, um, you know, private capital and with also with pharma companies that are interested. But I think, you know, I think everyone's waiting for kind of getting a good handle on that maximum tolerated dose out of the phase 1A work, which we hope to have this year. And, but in the meantime, you know, you, you don't want to start when you're finished, you know, so we're trying to do a lot of things in parallel. So we're getting the protocol ready. We're interviewing top managers for the positions. We're in discussions with private and public sources of capital for the spin out if it happens. But I think that's going to be a very important one because the potential now for Starlight is probably to go after five to six billion dollars in annual market potential and sales for these indications. And many, like I said, many of these indications uh, have had no success or no therapies, like the ones for pediatric CNS, like ATRT, uh, certain ones for brain mets, like brain mets from triple negative breast cancer and brain mets from drug resistant lung cancers, um, and also uh, GBM. Even in GBM, you know, there's been no approved monotherapy in 17 years. Um, and also, if you look at unmethylated glioblastoma, it's a subtype, unmethylated MGMT is referring to, uh, that also seems to have very, very strong uh, response to our drug. So again, the goal for our trials are always to go after as specific a population group where we know we can get an enhanced signal of efficacy that can get us over the standard of care question or generate a new standard of care. So those are the things that we look for. So that, you know, the sooner we get the, the signal from the maximum tolerated dose and the phase 1A, we want to go right into the phase two. So we're doing a lot of those things in parallel, you know, so as well, once we have that, we'll be able to um, launch Starlight in that indication. And that's, that's you know, 100% owned by Lantern right now. I see. Yeah. Uh, for, the, for potential to create significant value, do, do you see, you know, with, with the, uh, you know, constant and efficient process that you have in creating these data points, do you see yourself forming other companies like Starlight and rolling out? Yeah, I think the, in the back of our mind, the next one really is around the ADC. So the reason Starlight came into being is that we had really good signals, not just in one type of brain cancer, but across multiple. So immediately then your question is, you know, which of these do we go after or chase? Or can we do multiple of these chases? And then all of a sudden the needs of the CNS trials are different. Mm -hmm. They can be longer, they can be very, they can also be shorter. They can cost more because of the brain imaging, uh, you know, the death rates are super high. So there's just there's lots of challenges presented around that. 
Um, people are typically treated more at large scale kind of academic centers. They're not communities, whereas breast cancer, lung cancer, a lot of those are still, those are very much community based um, enrollment is very high. But in GBM and a lot of brain cancer is very concentrated. It's very different dynamic when you get in the clinical operations side and different dynamic in terms of the trial itself. And we said, you know what, this reserves its own focus. And the final key nail in the coffin on deciding that was the interest we got once we published it at the Society of Neuro Oncology. So we had, you know, Society of Neuro Oncology, we put two posters out, you know, year after year, and both times those drove a lot of interest from pharma because every pharma does not have a neuro oncology franchise. Okay. So market need, the ability of pharma to do a deal specifically in this space, the trial needs are different. So it kind of hit all the check marks. Sure. And it's not just a one-off indication. We're looking at a franchise type drug. So if it was one indication, then it's questionable whether you really should spin it out because then it's a, it becomes too binary, right? It's not like, you know, we should be able to incorporate one program, but now you're looking at multiple programs Many of them with no standard of care, and that you know. So we realize this really needs a team to accelerate it. The next one, which answers your question directly, that we see that's like this is our developing program in antibody drug conjugates. Mm -hmm. And so we've been able to now we're tackling some problems of how to how do we compress the cost of ADC development, not only for antibody drug conjugate but drug conjugates in general, whether it be antibody, peptide, or other drugs. And so we're actually in very early stages of doing some testing now of some co of new compounds, actually a number of new compounds that are drug conjugate compounds, some in Germany, some in the US, some in India. So we are running these in parallel. And I think that will be the next big potential spin out. If we see enough commonality, we see enough good signal, we see enough advancement, then we'll take that clinical risk and put it into another new co that focuses on these ADCs and other drug conjugates. Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's certainly a white hot area that big pharma is all over right now. And uh, that's exciting that you have that potential here as well. Uh, and I can see this model that you're creating is pretty exciting. And, and you're creating and making it in nice little neat packages, if you will, simply put by, by a guy that's not in your business, but uh, that move the needle for if you get it right, right, for uh, uh, par partners of magnitude that need to move the needle when they make decisions. So putting it into these forms like Starlight Therapeutics or companies and putting it into a nice, neat package as you roll it out uh, uh, provides, I think, uh, accelerates this sort of discussion process because it's all focused in maybe an area that Big Pharma is attractive to. So. Exactly. Uh, I, I commend you on that. It's, uh, that's that's exciting, and I I don't think many many people understand that that is within your uh, lantern's genetic makeup here. Uh, I think that's exciting to me, and uh, I think others will once they discover you have this um, on the near term. It's it could cause uh, real excitement about your potential. Um, we're we're uh, running a little late here, so I wanted to give you an opportunity, though, to sort of wrap up. I think we covered most of the questions this time, and I would, <clears throat> you know, invite the tribe that was on today and the tribe that will watch this video at our Tribe Public uh, YouTube channel as we move forward to, uh, if they want to hear more, if we miss uh, anything that people want to understand, or as you make advancements, to invite you back on as we move forward. And so we can learn more and understand. Uh, we will actually, for your, for your audience, I mean, you can obviously clearly help us with getting the message out to a broader range of people, but we will be having um, a detailed um, kind of a platform day where we talk in detail about the radar platform and the roadmap for the next 12, 18 months. We expect that sometime before the end of the year that we'll be uh, doing that. So you can, we'll hopefully be inviting all your tribe members to that as well. Sure. And uh, <clears throat> as many know, we're going to be having uh, Panna and Lantern out in certain tribe cities as we move forward, as we've already done. If you have not seen him in person and want to learn more from him, please express to the wish list process that you want that to happen. We'll do our best to coordinate with Panna. Um, in the meantime, uh, Panna, is there one last uh, sort of uh, summary you'd like to, to sum up here before we sign off? No, I think uh, these are good questions. I think you know we've got a, a great team, great collaborators. We've got patients in trials and a growing AI platform with a very clear 
trajectory of which patients to go after and what kind of endpoints we're looking for. At the same time, we continue to be innovative. You know, we're not just heads down. We're looking at new ways to create innovation and value for investors, such as spin outs like Starlight, such as our growing ADC program. And so I think there's a lot of ways that um, Landrum will generate value for people who want to be at the intersection of biotech and AI. And I think um, mm -hmm. that's a great space for people to be at. Definitely. Well, thanks again, Panna, for taking the time. Thanks again for the tribe for also you taking the time to learn more with us. And I look forward to uh, future programs with you. And uh, note again, the video will be up at the YouTube channel as soon as we can later today or uh, this weekend. And uh, please tune in as we move forward and let us know who you want to see and if you want uh, our friend Panna back. Thanks again, Panna. Have a great uh, weekend, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.